Hi, my name is Nessie Reed, and I am director of the Global Environments Network. And it's my real delight to be part of the Herboretum with um, Meredith and Lara. This coming Friday, we'll be talking about conservation and resilience. And so ahead of the, of the panel on Friday, um, Meredith invited me to talk a bit about my experience of running a global environmental network, which I, which I am director of, and also speaking about the role of uh, resilience and what resilience looks like. And something I really want to talk about today is the link between um, grief and our fear um, and how it can be transformed into a force for good. And I would argue that addressing our grief and being able to really um, come to know it is a really powerful tool for resilience, both on an individual level, but also on a collective level. And in order to do that, I want to take you on a bit of a journey. And it relates to a story from around 15 years ago, can't believe it's that long, um, that when I was starting my degree in London, um, and I was in my second year of my degree at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, and before I should do that, I should actually say a bit more about myself and where I am speaking to you from. I'm speaking to you from West Wales in the UK. So for any of you that know Wales very well, I'm just outside of Cardigan and I live on an organic farm in West Wales. So going back to the story. So it's a cold, crisp morning in April. And as I leave home, my student digs, the bright blue sky outside promises summer. And I remember feeling this sense of kind of excitement for what was, what was to come. And cycling on my usual Monday morning route to my archeology span lecture, I stop off at my favorite cafe in North London and the coffee is so good and the cake so irresistible, I find it near impossible not to try and pop in every morning. And some days I resist, but this day is not an exception. And so finding a cosy corner with a steaming coffee, coffee and probably a cinnamon bun, if I remember rightly, I begin to read the newspaper and my favorite ritual of the day has begun. And so at this point, I'm just going to share my screen with you. And so as I open the newspaper, a double spread, I see an image very similar to this. And it's an olive Ridley turtle. Well, the image I see is an olive Ridley turtle, double page spread encrusted from nose to foot in thick black oil and considered to be the largest marine oil spill in the history of the petroleum industry. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill was beyond catastrophic for any biological life it encountered. So you may remember during that time, if you are old enough to, um, of seeing just horrendous images for weeks, if not months in the newspaper, images um, similar, similar to these. Um, in the first birthing season for dolphins after the spill, dead baby dolphins washed up along the Mississippi and Alabama shorelines at about 10 times the normal number, 10 times. And personally, I feel when I see an image like this and I hear a statistic or a, a fact like that, I don't, I don't quite know what to do with that information. I don't really know how to process it. And so... I just invite you to take a moment to, to engage with the feeling that comes up for you when you see this dolphin. Without thinking too much, if you could think of a word or a, a feeling that you could put a name to, just make a note of what that, of what that is. Maybe nothing comes up. Maybe it's numbness. Maybe it's too much anger to even put a word to it. Maybe, maybe you don't like dolphins, <laughs> who knows? So going back to the coffee shop, in that moment, as these images similar to this one 
appear in the newspaper, I've lost my appetite. Coffee tastes far too bitter. And all I can really feel in that moment is this expanding sense of despair. This feeling of what is the point? What's the point in trying to do anything? What's the point in even um, thinking about recycling or trying to um, care for the environment when things like the, the oil spills such as these happen on such an unprecedented scale that it feels so difficult and so impossible to go on. And so for months, this feeling lurks and I can't find a way out, out of the recurring question. What's the point? What's the point when there's just so much destruction in the world? And so a few months later, I find myself at a Pray for Peace demo in Trafalgar Square. And one of my dear friends who happens to be a Sufi, she shouts over the crowds, grief is just a form of love. It's an expression of what your heart most cares about. The grief you feel is a powerful, powerful tool. The grief you feel is just, it's just love. And suddenly the Olive Ridley Cafe experience makes sense and the dots join up. And that feeling of crippling, almost paralytic fear, which can often manifest for me personally as anger, it's like I realize it's here for a reason. I love this Sufi aphorism, which I think speaks really well to this. When the heart weeps for what it has lost, the soul laughs for what it has found. This is kind of a little bit sentimental of me, but I just couldn't help put up a picture of two baby tawny owls. And the reason being is that I'm a massive bird geek and an avid bird watcher. And I, for my other work, I edit a science journal around biodiversity. And I see images like this and I find it hard not to feel this deep sense of love, this deep sense of awe at the natural world and what it offers. And I'm reminded that when I see images of wildlife or people um, or any sentient life or insentient life for that matter, um, suffering, it's like that grief I'm, I increasingly realize is a powerful force for good, for action. C.S. Lewis apparently said, and I quote, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I am not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness, the yawning, I keep on swallowing. At other times it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There is a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says or perhaps hard to want to take it in. And I find that this is a really um, brilliant way, the, the final part of that, that it can be a sense of, and I, I of course should name that I'm speaking from my personal experience, so I can't speak for, for others, but what I've observed from myself and also from our members within the Global Environments Network, which is 500 plus people, is that sometimes this feeling of grief, it can feel like, a form of death. It can be a sense of completely switching off, of shutting off, of numbing. You need a kind of freeze, um, flight mode. Um, sorry, fight or flight, freeze or fawn. It's that sense of I need to retreat. And often that can be a case when people face burnout. We see a huge amount with environmental um, and environmental leaders and conservation leaders and um and it's like how do we make sure that doesn't happen how do we keep enough hope and faith in our hearts and not let the grief um transform into something that becomes ultimately nihilism so now i feel i see and i try to see grief as my teacher and a sign and a signal for what i most care about um and so from the moment on, from the Olive Ridley moment, I realize I need to step into that grief. I need to step into that shadow, whether it's for um, the environment, for the, for the planet, or whether it's for social justice, 
that actually that grief is a, is a powerful guiding force. So fast forward a decade, I'm going to take you to um, the website of the Global Environments Network. So as I've already mentioned, again, the Global Environments Network supports people dedicated to social and ecological justice. And we have 500 plus members. And please visit our website if you'd like to find out more. Here is an image of one of our Global Environments Summer Academies. It's pretty obvious what we're doing, Human Pyramid, which is great fun. And our summer academies bring 25 international participants from all around the world. And it's a th almost a three week academy. Um, and it's a really, really quite a life changing experience. Here is ALSA 2019, which was a school for food resilience in Peru. And this was run by alumni from our network, um, bringing together lots of local local people to share knowledge around food resilience and agroecology. Here is another one of our summer academies. This was from 2014 in Bern in Switzerland. And so, yeah, fast forwarding now to, to looking at the, the network and also my work with deep adaptation. And for those of you that don't know Deep Adaptation, um, it was a paper written by Jem Bendel in July 2018. And essentially, it looks at the personal and collective changes that are needed to prepare for and live with societal disruption and collapse. And the way I've come to interpret Deep Adaptation is rather than just accepting business as usual and as things are, how do we really, really adapt and evolve in a way which is both intelligent, but also means we can thrive and survive and everyone can come along at the same time. So it's not just for the chosen few, uh, the privileged. Um, so we don't know exactly what will happen, but we understand that at the very least disruption of the biosphere and the climate is forcing us to change how we live and may lead to global societal collapse. Deep adaptation is a way of framing our current global situation that can help people to refocus on what's important in life while our social order collapses under the weight of its own consumption, pollution and inequality. We are finding new ways of being with ourselves and being together no matter what happens. And that last paragraph that I was reading comes from the Deep Adaptation website. And so in front of me, you can see a slide from St. Ethelberger's Centre for Reconciliation and Peace. And if you don't know St. Ethelberger's, I highly re recommend checking them out. They are a really wonderful organisation that's based in Liverpool Street in the centre of London. And it's an incredible 14th century church um, that was uh, created as a centre for peace and reconciliation after um, bombings in, in the 1990s in London. And so I was part, I was really blessed to be part of a year long deep adaptation programme with St. Ethelbergers with a cohort of 16 other amazing human beings. And during the, the course, the first part of the course, we had an opening retreat. And on the opening retreat, which is about five days long um, in a place called Kent. So for those of you who don't know the UK that well, Kent is just outside of London. And on about the third day, we were asked the question, what would complete climate breakdown look like to you? And I have to say, it was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. It was probably pretty high up there in terms of traumatizing experiences, but it was also one of the most empowering. Um, and it was, it was so important because I felt, how can I be director of an environmental charity um, and not come to terms with my deep grief and my my terror of what might of what might come. And based on the idea of you can't manage what you can't measure, being able to really step into this question was very empowering. And so it involved essentially people drawing out um, essentially cartoons is the wrong word, but but kind of simple drawings of of what their worst nightmares would look like. And I probably don't need to list them but you can imagine it was uh it was really traumatic and very very difficult to do um 
And so when I came out of the retreat, I went to visit a friend in London and I was walking along in a place called Crystal Palace. And I felt this overwhelming sense of joy and this overwhelming sense of um, possibility, which is really strange, I think. And I found it strange because I thought I'm walking almost skipping along the street. And yet two days ago, I didn't I didn't think I would ever be able to come back from the, the fear I was feeling around what it would look like to have complete climate breakdown and the impact it would have on human human civilization and the the ability to be able to um speak to speak to that fear meant that i could then create a roadmap in my head to make sure that that didn't happen that i could be part of creating a story and creating possibility that that didn't have to result in what that worst nightmare would look like and so just to finish about deep adaptation, um, there's, there's four R's of deep adaptation, which I think can be a really useful framework. And I think we'll probably discuss or at least touch on them maybe on, um, on Friday during our panel, Lara, Meredith and I, um, and Lara will be speaking about existential risk and risk management. And I think the, the four R's really help when thinking about risk as well. So resilience, what do we most value that we want to keep and how? relinquishment what do we need to let go of so as not to make matters worse so are there luxuries we don't need are there redundancies we don't need how do we really choose what we can relinquish restoration what could we bring back to help us with these difficult times reconciliation with what and whom shall we make peace as we awaken to our mutual mortality and I find these four R's are really uh, not easy, but a really, really important um, framework to work through. And so how does this uh, impact what we do practically at the Global Environments Network? And one big pillar of our work is to, um, is to explore resilience. And included in that is looking at, at grief and fear as a transformative power for good. I've just put this slide up here because I'm personally really fascinated how human beings are, I would say broadly speaking, especially those who are in a privileged power to do so, um, have a great innate power for destruction and frankly, probably stupidity, if that's the right word, but also an incredible power for, for, for good and for integrity and for beauty. And this image goes back to, um, the oil spill of volunteers um, cleaning up some of the oil spill on the beaches. And so we're going to have in June of this year, a retreat led by an amazing person, Camille Barton. Um, I recommend checking out Camille's website. Um, and the, the retreat will be looking at weaving grief, the body and transformative justice. And so again, using grief as a transformative tool. So if you'd like to find out more about that, please go to our website. And so I'll leave it there. And just to finish to say that um, I do really believe as trite as it might sound that our, our, resilience, our resilience comes from within. Um, and I think the more we step into uh, what's really sitting in our hearts, the more we can really, really transform that into something deeply powerful. So I look forward to connecting with you all hopefully on Friday. And if you'd like to get in touch and find out about Gen, please do. I'd love to hear from you and thank you for listening.